Okay, so, all right, now up to the Atlantic slave trade, and um, uh, this is not too complicated. It's going to be a very easy presentation, easy peasy stuff, not too much economics here. Here is John Thornton, Jinki Ye Kitab, Africa and the Africans in the Making of the Atlantic World, 1400 to 1800. And uh, that is his wife, who is also uh, a collaborator with him on many several works, Linda Haywood. And he's a professor at Boston University. Uh, you know, he's written lots of books. The Kingdom of Congo, Civil War and Transition, Africa and Africans in the Formation of the Atlantic World, The Congolese Saint Anthony, etc. Warfare in Atlantic Africa and a Cultural History of the Atlantic World. These are some of the books he's written. Um, and he's highly decorated, etc. Now, the first thing that I want to come to is what is the mode of production of pre-capitalist Africa? You may have already guessed when you, when you, because you've heard Polanyi's lecture, you may have sort of already guessed that it's not capitalism, naturally. It's a very different system. The first thing Thornton tells us is that there is an absence of landed private property. There's no private property of land. Land is not private property. I'm saying the same things in three different ways. This is almost strange, inconceivable, is it not? Bhai, zameen hai, to kisi ki hogi. Magar aisa nahi tha. Zameen thi, magar kisi ki nahi thi. Yani ki, you could not buy and sell land. You, of course, worked the land. You had possession of the land. You say, yaar, yaar, kaam kar but you couldn't say, yaar, ye main bechna cha raho, khareed mere se. That never happened. That's not a labor market in land did not exist. Cultivators had fairly secure rights to farm, but probably not to sell, alienate, or rent this land. So you could farm the land, but you couldn't sell it. Alienate also means the same thing, ke, to sell something, um, or rent it out, etc. Land was actually plentiful. Land was not the problem. If you wanted to do agriculture, it wasn't land which was the main problem. The problem may have been water, the problem may have been seeds, the problem may be labor, the problem may be other things, wild animals, etc. But zameen bothi, land both. By the way, if you know anything about the Mughal Empire, uh, or sorry, India, uh, pre-colonial India, land was also not private property here in India before the British arrived. They turned it into private property. Land was also not private property in most of the Muslim world. Land, and similarly, was not private property in Africa. And land was also not private property in China. Most of the world, it seems, land was not private property. Where was it private property? Europe. OK, yes. Even in Europe, before enclosure, it was not the private property. Exactly, exactly. Um, the cultivators lived in a corporatist social structure where the wealth of a family was mainly determined by what they could produce by their own labor or trade. जो खुद काम किया है, वो ही आपकी family की more or less wealth को determine करेगा. उसमें से एक हिस्सा obviously आपने ruling class को भी अदा करना है. States' real control was exercised more over people than over land. What an interesting idea. The ruling class was given a revenue assignment by the state. कि यहाँ से आपने revenue लेकर आना, extract करना है. So this, for example, in Europe, tax was assessed on land. In Africa, people rather than land were taxed. An African tribute might also include rights to labor and service. So tax, what we are calling here tax, actually it's a tribute, may also include that you have to work for the king. You have to do some work for the king. The absence of any form of private wealth um, other than through the state greatly inhibited, Thornton says, the growth of capitalism and ultimately, he even says, progress in Africa. Maybe, maybe not, but that's his view. Okay? No private property in land. Very important. Very different economic system. Tribal, pre-capitalist economic system. Some places tribal, some places another kind of system, and so on. Iron was developed in Africa by 600 BC, or even earlier, on the Sudanese fringe of the emerging Sahara Desert. African steel was equal to that made anywhere in the 15th century. But African steel still required considerable quantities of wood, and this was not always available, which meant that increasingly the best iron work was done on the northern edge of the rainforest, where there was a conjunction of wood supplies and iron ore. Because you needed to smelt the iron, you need to melt it, right, and then make something steel out of it. So you needed a lot of wood to start the fire that would do that, and to make it hot enough. So that's why it was in certain regions. But these are all African weapons, as you can see steel weapons. Europe offered nothing particularly great or new to Africa that Africa did not already produce, says Thornton. At that time, okay, it's crucial to know that at that time, they were not that different. They were not that far apart in terms of the things that they were able to make and produce. Africa had many great kingdoms 
We often think of Africa as just being, if you saw the previous picture, you think that everybody's just living in the, um, uh, you know, as in a tribal sort of formation uh, without any surplus and without any state, etc. But that's not the case. Egypt is part of Africa. Maybe you don't think that way, but of course, Egypt is very much part of Africa. And everybody knows that Egypt is one of the most ancient civilizations in humanity. Uh, it coalesced around 3,100 years before Jesus Christ. It's about 5,000 years before us. Really, really old civilization. The Egyptians developed quarrying and surveying, monumental pyramids, temples and obelisks, a system of mathematics, a system of medicine, irrigation systems, agricultural production techniques, planked boats, glass technology, writing. As you know, they had their own writing. And the earliest known peace treaty, politics, religion, its art and architecture were widely copied and its antiques are even today carried off into the far corners of the world. Even in Beria town, I'm sure you have some uh, Sphinx or pyramid or something like that, you know, <laughs> some cheap copy of that, right? So Egypt is an example of a great African kingdom. Similarly, you may not know this, Ethiopia was an example of another great uh, African kingdom, the kingdom of Axum, Zagwi, Solomon, the Ethiopian Tigrayan, and Amharic ruling class was a proud one, tracing its descent to Solomon. So they said, this is, this is Hazrat Suleiman, the Solomon the wise, the, the king of the Jews. So the Ethiopians traced themselves to, uh, to that Judaist, um, to the traditions of Judaism. And uh, this is also referred to as black Zionism. This is very different from Israeli Zionism. This is black Zionism. Okay. Um, a great deal is known of the superstructure of the Ethiopian Empire. Whether this descent is correct or not is irrelevant because there's lots of historians who say, no, no, it's fictitious. It wasn't really, there isn't really a direct descent to King Solomon, the wise. But they ne definitely claimed it. They said, yes, we are descendants of King Solomon, the wise. We are part of that uh, whole Zionist tradition, etc. Not the modern Zionist tradition. Okay. A great deal is known of the superstructure of the Ethiopian Empire, especially its Christianity and its literary culture. They embraced Christianity very early on, very, very early on. In fact, if you know your history, you would know that at one point in time, when the Muslims were being persecuted in uh, Mecca, they, uh, uh, some of them went to Egypt where there was a Christian king, right? Sorry, they went to Ethiopia where there was an uh, Egyptian king. They didn't go to Egypt. They went to Ethiopia when there was an Ethiopian Christian king. Sorry, my mistake. <laughs> um, okay. History was written to glorify the king and the nobility, especially under the rest restored Solomonic dynasty, which replaced the Zagwi in uh, 1270 AD. Fine illuminated books and manuscripts became a prominent element of Amharic culture. Equally fine garments and jewelry were produced for the ruling class and for the church. The top ecclesiastics were part of the nobility and the institution of the monastery grew to great proportions in Ethiopia. So Ethiopia used to be, uh, now today we have a very different image of Ethiopia. Everybody's starving or whatever, you know, starving children of Ethiopia, etc. That was because of the famine in the 1980s. But Ethiopia used to, was a great kingdom and a great civilization. Nubia, which is of course on the upper Nile, which is a different civilization from the pharaohs and the Egyptians. Uh, the early Neolithic settlements have been found in the central Nubian region dating back to 7000 BC. Imagine that. The, there was a state of Kush called early Christianity came there. The monastery was a major unit of production. Numerous peasant huts were clustered around each monastery, which functioned very much as they did, as, as did the manner of a feudal lord. Brass work, iron mining, smelting, all of these things were going on in the Nubian kingdom. This is an is a picture from the ruins of a Nubian city or palace. Then there were great kingdoms in the Great Lakes. Here are the Great Lakes. Uh, here is the region of the Great Lakes of, uh, uh, of Africa. And you can see that there were several kingdoms around this uh, area. Here they are named as you can see. Some of them are named here, etc. So there were many kingdoms here as well. And the Maghrib, of course, the word Maghrib, you know what the word Maghrib means. Mashrik and Maghrib, right? So Maghrib means the West. Actually, the Arabs coined the term Maghrib, and they didn't mean the West by it, they meant this West by it. So that's kind of interesting, and that just became the West in general. But the Maghrib is actually North Africa, okay? Uh, the Maghrib is where the Berbers, Berber tribes existed, and they play a very important role in Islamic history, as well as in history in general. Uh, it was the seat of the famous society of Carthage, usse pehle, Tunisia, etc. You remember that Rome and Carthage were very important. 
uh, and that flourished between 1200 BC and 200 BC. It was home of the Berber people who conquered Spain and Portugal. Its natives controlled the Western Mediterranean and its armies took over most of Portugal and Spain. You know, that, this, that after the Umayyad dynasty collapsed over here, it was the Berbers basically who reconquered uh, Spain. And it was also the home of non-conformist Christianity. And you might be surprised to discover that it was also the home of Kharijite Islam. Kharji is, of course, the third major sect of Islam that departed soon after the death of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Uh, one was the al Tashi, the other was the Sunnat, uh, Sunni, you know, al Sunnat wal Jamaat, whatever. And the third, of course, was the Kharjis. And that idea became very popular and that led to a revolt. Uh, the Kharji revolt of 739 AD is considered a uh, you know, nationalistic revolt of the Berber people. That led to the Moroccan nationalism three centuries later and also the rise of the al uh, Muhad dynasty, which is a very important dynasty in Islam. Oh, by the way, you might also, may or may not know this, but a period ke andar yahan pe khilafat bhi rahi hai. Ek alada khilafat yahan pe North Africa ke andar rahi hai. So that's also kind of interesting. Oh, this is Mansa Musa, by the way. Have you heard of him? Yes. Tell us about him. Mansa. Yeah. And when he went to for his uh, pilgrimage to Makkah, uh, he was accompanied by an entire army. His whole like state was moving with him, and he was distributing gold on the way, which had that impact on the entire economy. Richest, one of the richest people uh, in all of history, perhaps. And then you had the Western Sudan kingdoms, three celebrated uh, empires that flourished in Western Sudan between the 8th and the 17th century. The Ghana Empire, 8th to 11th century. The Mali Empire, 13th to 16th century. And the Songhai Empire from the 15th to the 17th century. All of them, by the way, are basically around the Niger River, as you will see. Okay, their great power came from the trans-Saharan trade and the export of gold, ivory, kola nuts and slaves. Trade was also the principal means for the introduction and spread of Islam. So here you can see the Mali Empire, you can see the Niger River and it's, this is the empire basically along the river. And over here you can see the Ghana Empire and now you have modern Ghana of course that you know of which was the first country to become independent in Africa and here you have the uh, uh, what was it? Uh, um, huh? You have the Songhai uh, uh, Empire over here, right? Yes? Um, so, Sudan extended across the width of Africa Oh, Western, uh, yeah, Western Sudan is, this is Western, this is what's called Western Sudan. Although now Sudan, the country, is a, is a distinct country, uh, but um, as a region, it was, you know, across the Sahara sort of thing at that time. Good point, good question. Here are some other kingdoms that you can see. Um, up there you can see the Umayyad Khilafat and so on, the um, Islamic kingdoms. And we, you, what, what you also notice is that the, many of the Islamic kingdoms, including the Fatimids, etc., and others, are also African kingdoms. So Islamic history and African history are not separate from each other. And we know about a little bit about Islamic history at least, to know that, uh, you know, uh, great discoveries and architecture and mosques and empires and states, so much else was created, right? There is, you can see Ptolemaic Egypt, which is basically when Alexander co conquered Egypt, right? Um, and you can see so many different sort of empires, etc. These are not all of them, right? Here's the Songhai Empire again, right? Uh, the Ghana Empire, etc. Acha. Then you have Zimbabwe, not today's Zimbabwe, but the great Zimbabwe. It was a medieval city in the southeastern hills of Zimbabwe near Lake uh, Matir Kivi. I don't know, I'm not saying that right, probably, right? <laughs> uh, and the town of Mosvingo. I'm probably also, if any African hears that on the video, they're going to like, I'm going to go to Pakistan, I'm going to shoot this guy for mispronouncing this. It was thought to have been the capital of a great kingdom during the country's late Iron Age, about which little is known. Construction on the city began in the 9th century and continued until it was abandoned in the 15th century. The edifices are believed to have been erected by the ancestral Shona people. The stone city spans an area of 7.2 square kilometers and could have housed up to 18,000 people at its peak. It is recognized as a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. Here is the city, as you can see. It's a, it's a walled city. Amazing, isn't it? Okay, now when the Europeans start to come into uh, Africa, and we're not just talking about North Africa, we're talking about the, you know, the heart of Africa. So they have oceans, ships, and as a consequence of that, you know that the whole slave system begins. So the thing to understand about the Atlantic Ocean, first and foremost, is that it carries a very strong current called the 
north to south Canary Current, right? Named after the Canary Islands. And what that means is that you can go from the north to the south, but then it becomes very difficult to go from the coast of West Africa back up to Europe, okay? What that meant was that at, until bo uh, you had ships that could weather those currents, it was not possible for people to really go to Africa and come back. If you went to Africa, that's where you had to stay. And that's why it was also not possible for Africans to come to the Mediterranean or to go from the Sahara, sorry, from the west coast of Africa to the north, to the northern seas. It was very difficult until you had these big ships. Well, these are the kind of big ships that the Europeans were able to build. They were able to build these ships because they are mainly a seafaring people. They were mainly a seafaring people. They have two sea systems that they have used. One is the Mediterranean Sea, which is by the standard of seas a very, very calm sea. Okay? It's a, it's a nice sea. It's a, it's a nice little poodle kind of piara sea. Arabian Sea is a very difficult sea. Okay? Um, and so shipping can develop there. And then you also have the, the North Sea, uh, the Baltics and so on, right? The Baltic Seas, North and Baltic Seas. So frequent travel between all of these seas because all their trade was going on with these seas, et cetera, meant that their shipbuilding capacity continued to improve and improve and improve and improve. And you see, why, not, why ships and why not land? Because when you have a ship, you can carry bigger stuff, cheaper, faster, et cetera. It's a great way to transport things European. and people. Sorry? European. Huh. So European economy, hey, Mediterranean economy. Roman Empire is basically a Mediterranean empire. You know, the Greeks are basically a Mediterranean power. The Phoenicians are basically a Mediterranean power, blah, blah, blah. The, the Carthage Empire is a Mediterranean power. The Berbers are also a Mediterranean power. Everybody around the Mediterranean is trading with each other, think, you know, exchanging ideas with each other. It's like, a, it's like an economy, you know, sort of, where transportation is very, very easy and fast. So Usme, what develops? These bigger and bigger and bigger ships. Whereas the Africans basically used boats. They didn't have ships, they had boats, because they would also, they would mainly use this to not go into the sea, but to, to do river navigation. And they did a lot of river navigation, but for river navigation, you don't need huge ships, you need boats. So that's what they had. So African boats were often carved from a sing, single lo logs of tropical trees. They could carry 50 to 100 men. And Africans were, but Africans were unable to take a European ship by storm. To get on top of that ship, etc. Right? Sometimes when the two did fight, and they did fight many times, uh, Africans were incredibly brave. Uh, when the Europeans would fire guns at them, they had never seen guns before. Uh, and at first they would be like, what is this? But they would, it would not totally scare them off. It would scare them for a bit, startle them, but they were brave enough to still you know, charge the boats, etc. So control of the seas allowed Europeans to land freely on any islands, resupply their forces when necessary, and concentrate large forces for their big engagements. Imagine if you had a teleportation device, right? Wouldn't that be cool, Injil, if you had a teleportation device? Wouldn't you be able to dominate over all the other LUN students? You could magically transport to any classroom, you know, leave at any time, go get your book, uh, you know, go meet anybody at the Coca, and then wherever you wanted to appear, you could appear. So sea travel back in the 16th and 17th century was like this magical teleportation device. It took a while to get to wherever you were going, but you could suddenly arrive in this new place where people are like, where did this guy come from? You know? So it was like a portal. You know, I, I like to think of it in that way. Okay. Here now is the Atlantic slave trade. As you can see, it's all over the coast of West Africa. I went to Senegal, by the way, and I went to Gori Island, uh, the slave port, where people were taken you know, slaving, 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 slaves. And I said to myself that I put my hands on my hands and I said that I said that the human brutality is more brutal than any human brutality. There was such a place where they were telling me that when someone was a rebellious slave, they closed it in this room. It was so much that it was so hard that you couldn't stand up because it was so much that it was so much that it was so much. कहते थे दो हफ्ते उसमें बंद कर देते थे वहीं वो टट्टी भी करता था वहीं पेशाब भी करता था वहीं खाना भी खाता था उसके बाद उसकी मत मर जाती थी कहते थे आई एम सॉरी जो भी है सो इट यू सी दैट एंड यू रियलाइज दैट दिस वाज दे वर ट्रीटेड लाइक कैटल लाइक एनिमल्स बीइंग यू नो टेकन 
उन्होंने एक कमरा बनाया हुआ था वो चिल्ड्रन एक कमरा बनाया हुआ था वुमेन एक कमरा बनाया था वो मैन एक कमरा बनाया हुआ था वो थिन मैन कि इनको पहले खाना खिलाओ खाना खिला के इनको भेजना जैसे हम बकरे को मोटा करते हैं जिबा करने से पहले शॉकिंग सो एनी वे ऑल अक्रॉस अफ्रीका दिस वॉज हैपनिंग एंड द नंबर्स आर स्टैगरिंग वन आई वेंट टू सेनेगॉल द कार दे सेट थर्टीन मिलियन पीपल नाउ थर्टीन मिलियन पीपल वर टेकन एवरीबडी से ओवर टेन मिलियन तो ईजिली एवरीबडी एग्रीज जो कम से कम फिगर भी देता है वो कहता है ओवर टेन मिलियन तो बट टेन मिलियन थर्टीन मिलियन इज द नंबर दैट एक्चुअली सेट ऑन द शिप्स एंड वेंट हाउ मेनी डाइड इन द इन द वॉर्स दैट टुक प्लेस एंड इन द यू नो इन द हंटिंग ऑफ स्लेव एक्सेट्रा द ट्रांसपोर्टेशन जो यहाँ डूब गए जो बीमार हो गए वगैरह वो कितने मर गए कोई आइडिया नहीं अग, और वो जमाना बड़ा पुराना जमाना है आज की तरह पेनिसिलिन तो नहीं है तो यू कैन इमेजिन के अगर बाकी सारी चीज़ों में इफ यू कैप्चर टू एंड यू मैनेज टू सेंड वन दैट कुड भी ट्वेंटी मिलियन दैट कुड भी ट्वेंटी सिक्स मिलियन एट दैट टाइम इन हिस्ट्री वॉट इट मैंट वॉज एंड द प्रेफरेंस वॉज फॉर यंग मैन बुढ़ों को नहीं लेके जाते थे बहुत छोटों को नहीं लेके जाते थे औरतों को भी कम लेके जाते थे और रेशो अप्रॉक्सीमेटली होता था टू मैन वन वोमन ठीक है ये रेशो में लेके जाते नंबर ऑफ मैन बिकॉज दे नीडेड मैन टू वर्क द प्लांटेशन राइट दैट वर ओवर देयर आई टॉक अबाउट दैट जस्ट सेकेंड सो वट हैपन इन एफ्रीका ऑल द लेबर वेंट ऑल द यंग मैन सडनली देर नो यंग मैन टू बी फाउंड एनी वेयर इन एफ्रीका द वेमेन वर डूइंग द वर्क बट द यंग मैन वर ऑल गॉन यू कैन इमेजिन हाउ द इकोनॉमी कंप्लीटली कलेप्सड इन ऑन इट सेल्फ सिविलाइजेशन कलेप्सड इन ऑन इट सेल्फ एज अ कॉन्सिक्वेंस ऑफ द कंप्लीट एग्जिडस ऑफ ऑल ऑफ दीज यंग मैन हु हैड टू यू नो इन दैट पीरियड हैड टू डू दिस ऑल दिस मैनुअल वर्क सो ऑलमोस्ट रिमाइंड मी ऑफ द फैक्ट दैट इन पाकिस्तान एवरी ईयर वी लूज फ्रॉम हाफ अ मिलियन टू अ क्वार्टर ऑफ मिलियन यंग मैन मोस्टली मैन क्वार्टर ऑफ अ मिलियन यंग मैन went from pakistan to work in different countries abroad we're losing all that labor force and still we have a big population but we're losing all of that where did they go you can see brazil you can see uh, you can see this is british this was conquered by the british so this is british america this is portuguese america as you can see right um this is uh, french america as you can see over here right uh, this is spanish america as you can see on this side all of this is spanish america and that is dutch america which is over here right so you see that that is how that is where different people were and that that also accords to what languages are spoken there today uh, also there are people there are slaves going up here there are slaves going to europe there are slaves going to italy etc etc all over the place and if you are interested there are even slaves coming from this side of the coast all the way across and moving from this side of the coast over here also slaves being taken on land several times shocking but that's history yes but largely eastern africa remained untouched or by the atlantic slave trade yes there was another trade over here going on that the arabs were in charge of the uh. the arab muslims were in charge of this slave trade and that was a has a longer history than this history but this has a shorter but very intense history very very intense history question okay आगे चले सो वे डिड दे गो मोस्ट ऑफ दैम वेंट टू ब्रिजिल एज यू कैन सी 4.9 मिलियन टू ब्रिजिल देन ब्रिटिश कैरेबियन 2.3 मिलियन कैरेबियन में इतने स्लेव्स बिकॉज कैरेबियन वाज वन ऑफ द कॉटन प्लांटेशंस ऑफ द एम्पायर 1.8 मिलियन डेड स्पेनिश अमेरिकास 1.3 फ्रेंच कैरेबियन 1.1 1.7 नॉर्थ अमेरिका 0.4 मिलियन एक्सेट्रा दैट्स वेयर दे वेंट सो द वास्ट मेजॉरिटी यू नो वेंट टू आइदर ब्रिजिल और द ब्रिटिश कैरेबियन यस they speak portuguese we don't watch portuguese movies oh okay simple <laughs> you know um here's another very interesting graph that shows you where they all went you can see brazil 5 million at lima 0.5 million 4.5 million in the west indies 0.2 million in central america 0.3 million go to europe 0.5 million go to north america mexico city blah 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 here are the slave coast from congo all along the coast you see people are raiding European yeah, the Europeans had already. No, 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 the, the African African ones. Colonies. These colonies, yeah. in some places they had control, in other places uh, it depends on which period you are talking about. Because later you will see that the scramble for Africa takes place, and they actually take over mm -hmm. African countries as colonies. But in the initial period, they are making deals with various kings and tribal leaders, etc. Sell me the slaves, I'll give you guns. Sell me the slaves, I'll give you money. Money. So this created. um a triangular trade slaves would go from all this section of africa which is 
correctly colored red, and they would go to all of these parts of the uh, um, uh, American continent. And from this American continent, then sugar, tobacco, and cotton would flow to Europe. And when it would get to Europe there, it would be processed in the mills of Lancashire and uh, so on, and where it would become the finished product that it would become. And then the finished product would be sold. Manufactured goods from Europe, example, textile and spirits, would come back to Africa, would go to India, would go to China, would go to every market all over the world. So this was a triangle through which the Europeans became fabulously, fabulously rich. It was all based on slavery. All the big cities of Europe are based on as were the, based around this trade of the slave trade and the production that the slaves did and sent back. So here's a very interesting map. This is a map of the world at night taken by NASA. And you can see all the lights in Europe. Oh my god, Europe is like so full of lights. And you can see all the lights in America, especially on the eastern coast, etc. Western coast there's nobody, etc. And you can see some lights here in Brazil, etc. And you know, other parts of South America. But look at the African continent. It's mostly all of it is dark, right? All of it is dark. So question is, Africa is underdeveloped. We know this. Why did the slave trade play the main role? Why did the Europeans come to Africa? Some people say, oh, they were romantics. They wanted to explore the world. They wanted to have the joy of discovery. And also, they wanted to find an alternative route to India that would, that would go around the Muslims. You know, because Christian Muslim rivalry and so on. Others said, no, no, exploration was fueled by prospect of immediate profits. They just wanted money. Yes. Canada is freezing, right? So it, that was not the best temperature for cotton plantations and for um, sugar plantations and tobacco plantations. So the first places that people want to colonize were places where those things were the, the right um, um, environmental conditions for that kind of agriculture existed. By the way, C Christopher Columbus was not the first to discover America. Uh, in fact, the Vikings. yes, the Vikings had already made it across to the United States of America and, pro and gone to Canada, you know, because they went to, they hopped over from, uh, yeah, Iceland, well, they hopped to Iceland and from Iceland to Greenland and from Greenland then to Canada, basically. But then they were very used to the cold, so it was okay for them. <laughs> All right, so. But he says, Thornton says it was a combination of the prospect of finding new islands and the dream of reaching India that inspired Christopher Columbus in his voyage in 1492. Between 1340 and 1470, European expansion proceeded slowly along the African coast. It paid off handsomely for the private parties who had sponsored it. And then after that, later, the Portuguese crown began to sponsor larger trips. And of course, the Portuguese crown sponsored the trip of Christopher Columbus. Now, the big debate about Christopher Columbus is, should we chop his head off, cancel him, or should we have him? And for that, I had this video.